My country, tis a beast, sweet land of liberty, of the arts sing. Land where my fathers are, land of the pilgrims' pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, bringeth forth bread from the earth. Amen. 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 I would love to do the attendance. Uh, today we have 17 Rotarians and two guests. Um, President Megan, will you introduce your guest, please? I'm very happy to introduce this, my guest, uh, Ricardo Romulo. Ricardo is a uh, uh, long time. And we went to high school together, and he is a lawyer, a partner at Gardino um, Law Firm in Somerville. He does real estate, all sorts of different uh, law, and he lives with his family and three adorable daughters on Dickinson Road. And we are thinking maybe he'd like to do the So we don't know. <laughs> Welcome. And Pat President Murray, would you please uh, do a brief introduction to our speaker and guest? Please to do that, sir. Tori Frank. Hello, Rotarians. We have with us today Jim Manning, and I will be introducing him a little later on. He's our speaker. Jim, welcome. Thank you. Thank welcome. you. And uh, that concludes the attendance. All right, time for fines and happy dollars. I hope I'll start it off with five happy dollars. I'm thrilled that Ricardo is here, and I just want to thank everybody for their participation. We had three great um, senior barbecues, and thank you to Jim Trio for the donation to Fort Who else? Megan, I apologize. I've never missed anything, and I know you probably did a great job, so I'm getting ten uh, dollars towards uh, not being able to make the barbecue. I had to go out of time. Well, thank you. We missed President Megan, I have twenty happy dollars. I was not able to participate in the barbecue. I was away on vacation. The day I came back was the day I signed up, and then I had to work in the office. <coughs> Can you believe they still made you work and everything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we missed you as well, but we had to. Okay. Um, can you please bill me, uh, that person, Dan, uh, sixty dollars? Yes. Uh, I'm finding myself for also missing the barbecue uh, because I was golfing at uh, Bandit Dunes in Oregon for a week. It was spectacular. Um, so that's a fine and a happy dollar there. <laughs> and then I'm also happy because uh, Ben, my son, is now employed again. He was on strike with the writers for five months. And he's been in a bar for the last week celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. I've called him multiple times since the strike was over. And it's always this loud noise in the background. Like, Where are you, Ben? I'm at a bar. Why are you at a bar? Well, it's a strike for five months. So, you know. We're, we're all celebrating. He's celebrating. He's celebrating. So he, he goes back to writing uh, season four of Murders in the Building on Monday. So happy for that. Congratulations. I have 10 happy dollars because Ben's going back and I get to see another season of Murders in the Building. Thank you, Alan. I have uh, 10 happy dollars. I had to pull out of the banquet. But for the first time in my life, I had two funerals in one day. And uh, the last two members of my family of the previous generation. So guess who's left as the old man of the current generation? <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> How President Cleave? President Megan, uh, I'm going to find myself before President, uh, past President Dan finds it because I moved, bought a new vehicle. He was thinking about that at one of the barbecues, but he might have forgot about it. But also, uh, Gotti's great uh, voice and rendition, um, the song, songs. Uh, unfortunately, I think we forgot the welcome song, unless it's on your agenda. So oh, gonna, yes. But I'm going to pay you fine because of that. <laughs> 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 I didn't want my face to get that right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ricardo, you're going to pay us five dollars. Okay. Well, we'll do it. We'll do it after the five dollars. <laughs> 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 You have the power. You can get out of any fine you want. Yes. There you go. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Well, now, Cardi, would you mind leaving us in the welcome song? <laughs> yes, I'm proud of Cardi. And we welcome you. Who are you? Ricardo, you can rise. And we'll finish. And yes, our speaker, you can rise. You're also an alumni. I know. He's an alumni. Yes, he's an alumni. Okay, again, take two. To meet with us today, our door is always open to our friends at Rotary. We're glad to have you with us, and we hope you'll come again to Rotary Lexington. We all say welcome to visiting Rotarians. Welcome all you non-Rotarians. Welcome to our club in Lexington. We hope you'll come again.
one. One, three, one.
Um, as opposed to writing letters to Santa Claus, children will now Google Santa Claus. They will have Siri or Alexa call Santa Claus. And I receive about 10 to 15 of these calls every year. Um, I was walking down the street in, in Cambridge and I got a phone call from this little boy named Ryan. And Ryan had Googled Santa Claus's number. And he said, Sam, I really want to talk to you about what I want for Christmas. And I said, all right, Ryan, what, what would you like to have? He really wanted this green skateboard. Ryan and I had a lovely chat for a few minutes. This is not, you know, different from the norm, but just have a nice phone call with Ryan like I do many calls. A couple minutes later, the phone rings again, and it's his mom. Now, I completely understand. This poor woman is like, who is my son calling, and why did they have a, a three-minute phone call? And she says, uh, who is this? And I explained, I'm professional Santa Claus, and I think your son Googled me. Um, at this point, she told me, she's like, well, it makes sense that he called you. He always loved Santa Claus. We just got back from his father's funeral. And I guess he really wanted to talk to someone he could trust. Now, for me, that, that hit me like a shot. Like a, I'm, as Santa Claus, uh, you know, I face really wonderful moments, but I also face some challenging moments. Families who've lost loved ones. Um, in 2021, myself, uh, my wife and I both went through a cancer battle, so I had my own challenges. And so that, for, for that to happen, really, really affected me. The reason I bring this story up with all of you is this. I, as leaders in your community, especially as Rotarians, you are going to be leaders and oftentimes you're going to face people in, in, in different situations and you won't always know all of the truths. Um, so the reason I bring that story up is, is to let you know you always have the opportunity to, to make a difference and be prepared for, um, you know, what those two competing truths are. Um, all right, uh, let's shift topics a little bit. Um, I'm going to actually divide everybody right now into groups of two. So right now, if you can all choose a partner, uh, just groups of two, and choose who's going to be person A and who's going to be person B. We're going to take a couple of minutes to talk about some things. So right now, if you can all choose one person, um, pers one person will be person A, and one person will be person B. And I'll just yes. steal their water. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Do we have our person A's? Raise your hand if you are the person A. All right, person A, you are going to tell person B a story of a time that you had to, uh, that you were, that a rule was made up on the spot. Uh, this may be professional, this may be a volunteer situation, but person A, I want you to tell person B about a time you were in a leadership role or you witnessed a leadership a leader have to make a rule up on the spot and what that rule was. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to discuss this. Okay, example? Uh, yeah, so for example, um, uh, as a professional Santa Claus, one of my big rules is um, never put me within 10 feet of a fireplace. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand the idyllic scene where, you know, Santa Claus is next to the fireplace, except for the first time I was playing Santa Claus and sweat was dripping down my face. And the children kept asking, Santa, why are you so damp? <laughs> so that was my own personal rule. Um, but this is just an example where uh, a, a rule had to be made up on the spot. Maybe it was at a rotary meeting, maybe it was a volunteer organization, that kind of thing. So, all right. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah, a rule was made up on the spot. <laughs>
and nobody wanted to be the president, so, so you appointed yourself. I appointed myself. <laughs> okay, good. Very good. Very good. He would have lost if he put it up. To he would have lost. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this was at work, but person B, you're going to tell a story about a time that you saw a leader really step up to the plate and 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 really make a difference in their community.
And I said, give me something that says, I am the official Santa Claus for the city of Boston. <laughs> I got a nice little certificate from Mayor Menino. Um, and actually, when I met Mayor Menino, I asked him if he had been a good little boy. And for those of you who are in the know, he was always known as Mumbles. Santa, it's been a long time since anyone called me a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yes, so that was the uh, that was the path, and they originally asked me to go out and say ho ho ho, but I go on and I'm on stage and I've got a microphone and I say Boston, are you ready to like the big tree? Say yeah, and everyone says yeah, and I said oh no, I'm gonna lose my job even before I got it. So, but 12 years later, they still have me lighting the tree every year, and that's how I became the official Santa for the city of Boston. So, I don't think there was a lot of candidates to be honest with you. <laughs> I will take what I can get. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Is there a professional Santa's union or organization? Now, NPR did an amazing thing on this. There's <laughs> a number of organizations. There's the AORBs and the Real Orbs. The Amalgamated Order of Real Bearded Santa and the Regulated Order of Real Bearded Santas, neither of which I'm a participant in. There used to be one major Santa Claus organization in 2008. Uh, there was great division in the ranks, and they had a big meeting out in, I want to say it was Missouri. Um, fist fights uh, happened, uh, Santas were arrested, and now there's a great schism. And in the Santa world, folks, you cannot make this up, in the Santa world, you're either a reorb or an aorb, and the two do not uh, communicate. I like to think of myself as the Switzerland of Santa Clauses, because I don't participate in either. So. And that's where the movie Bad Santa came from? I, I think it was the, a lot of the inspiration came from that. So, so I'll throw a name out there. Do you Ooh. know Jack Kuna? I do not, but there are a fair amount of us out there. Yeah. So he, he actually grew up in Lexington. Oh, did he really? Guy. He was a year behind me in high school. And he's, I think he's at the mall now. He's the mall, Burlington Mall Santa. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Wait, he's the Burlington Mall Santa? Yeah. So he is one of the most famous Santas in the country. Five years ago, they tried to fire him and, uh, because he was making too much money. Or, no, no was it? Yeah, five years ago. And there was such a, a reaction from the, from, from, yeah, that, that they had to hire him back. There's two kinds of Santas. There's mall Santas, and generally the mall Santas just stay in the mall. And private event Santas like me that go and do corporate events, tree lightings, that kind of thing. So... And in the Santa Claus world, there's lots of nicknames, like this one's Jolly Santa, this one's Sleepy Santa. I don't know if this is good or bad, but I'm known as Business Santa. So, <laughs> good, bad, or indifferent. I'm also one of the younger Santas, which is kind of ironic because I'm 47, but uh, yeah, no, so most of the Santas are, are on the older side. Yeah, right. Jim, it was, when I was growing up, they had a Santa Claus in the city that I grew up in, Malden, there was, was a store called Jocelyn's. And, um, it was a takeoff on Jordan Mash. Jordan Mash actually um, bought it out eventually and it became a Jordan Mash. So we used to go to the one in Malden, then we go to the one in, in Boston, sit on the lap of the sand and you know, yeah. all this stuff on Washington Street. Do you do any of the big department stores itself now anymore? No, no. I did Macy's for a little while, but then <coughs> most of my work is just private events. So. So when you did Macy's, did you have in New York City? No, 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 that's like the creme de la creme. Oh, okay. The Macy's Santa is like the Santa to be. He makes over six figures a year. He has to keep his weight within 10 pounds. He has to keep uh, basically everything body-wise, like his beard and all that has to be regulated by Macy. And no one is allowed to know who he is. So, oh. yeah, if there was a conspiracy theorist here, Santa Claus should definitely be part of your research. So, yeah. <laughs> Do you ever run into the situation where somebody says, oh, there's no real Santa? Oh, well, quite often. What do you, what, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, so in, in terms of people wondering, like, you know, especially children, like, you know, Santa's not real. I took improvisation classes, and this helped a lot. So I never try to argue with a child or anybody. I mean, there are some adults who get a little uh, intense. Um, <laughs> you'd be surprised. Um, but I just try to say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you told me that. What would you like for Christmas? And nine times out of ten, they will immediately start to tell me about all their toilets. So, but the best though is the pandemic. And I was actually going to share this as my final story. During the pandemic, I did a thousand visits. All of them were virtual. Um, I usually do between sixty and seventy in-person appearances, and everything was on the screen. The best part about the pandemic, as much as it was frustrating not to be able to speak to, you know, see children in person, was um, all the parents filled out cheat sheets, and I had this nine-year-old boy says. You're not the real Santa Claus. I was like, what do you mean? He says, the real Santa Claus would know my elf on the shelf. Do you all know about elf on the shelf? Okay. Well, if you're not familiar, elf on the shelf, it's, you know, keeps an eye on the kids. It's sort of like the Gestapo of the North Pole. Uh, and it's a toy. So I said, you're elf on the shelf? You mean 
Elfie McElferton. <laughs> because I had the cheat sheets, like, oh, it really is Santa Claus. So, um, but the best way to, to handle that is just to, you don't really try to argue with anybody's belief. It's just a lot of yes and. I'm glad you, you know, I'm never going to deny that. I'm never going to affirm it. Um, you know, in fact, one of the things you'll never find me do with Santa Claus is promise a gift. Um, you know, children will get up in my face like, am I going to get that Nintendo Switch? We'll see what we can do, make sure to be good. Because you never know if a, f a parent or a caregiver is going to deliver on the present. So, yeah. Because I believe in Santa Claus, I want to know how the supply chain issue is this year. Do you have any problems with unions? Three years ago, the elves unionized, and it's made my job a lot more difficult with Santa Claus. Fortunately, I've worked out some partnerships with AWS, and um, you know, we're just trying to step up to the plate wherever we can go. So. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Where do the letters go that the people? Right, and they go to the post office. Mm -hmm. So, um, post office actually had a program that goes back all the way over 100 years ago. Um, certain people sign up to take these letters and deliver them to children to um, children in need. So, parents, uh, if, if you send it to a certain address, then then those letters will go, and oftentimes those gifts are received. But a lot of the letters just um, they just get sent, and they're they're not really responded to. So. Um, what's funny is now parents will always say, oh, Santa, do you want this letter? And then five minutes later, dad will come back because they forgot what was on their kid's list. And now they need to claim it back so they remember what to get the right thing. So. Because they're all in an envelope now that they know. They can see what they ask for on the <laughs> Um I do remember doing one visit one year, though. Uncle Joey looked a lot like me. Uncle Joey was Santa for years. And finally, the kids were old enough to, like, they're like, hey, Uncle Joey. So they hired me to kind of throw the kids off. So Uncle Joey waits in the garage, I walk in, and all the kids are like, hey, Uncle Joey. I was like, no, I'm Santa Claus. Well, in walks Uncle Joey. And those kids' jaws were on the floor. I said, Uncle Joey, where were you last year? He said, Santa, I'm so sorry. I was really busy, I couldn't make it. So I was like, that's okay, Joey. And we got at least another three years of belief out of those kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so oh, can I, yeah. why do you do it? I love it. Um, you know, uh, I got out of college, I worked a lot of corporate jobs, uh, not a lot, I worked a few corporate jobs, I was not a right fit for any of them. I got laid off from the wedding center in Boston, and I won a plane ticket anywhere in the world. I went to Australia for six months to clear my head, I was in the outback, I met these indigenous kids who had never seen a balloon twisted before, because when I'm not Santa Claus, I'm also a magician. I started twisting balloons for them and entertaining them, and I realized the only thing I was really good at was making kids laugh. Fast forward about six months, one of my clients says, do you play Santa Claus? When you start your own business, you say yes to anything that can bring you an income. Um, I bought my first suit off of Craigslist, and I'll never forget the moment I had a little boy from Ireland sitting on my lap at Logan Airport that first year. And he says, are you the real Santa Claus? And I says, yeah, why? He's like, because Santa Claus speaks in an Irish brogue. I said, well, when I'm in Ireland, I speak in a brogue. When I'm in America, I speak in an American accent. And that convinced him. Um, so that first year, I realized what a difference I made. Um, and ever since then, I've just, it's, it's really, it's been a call. Um, but it's also my full-time business. This is how I make my living. It's, it's, it's a very unusual way, but, um, you know, I, I really feel like I'm able to make a difference and, and do something that I enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do off-season? Uh, the rest of the year, I'm a professional speaker and a magician. So, um, most of my work is educational shows in libraries. Um, so, um, actually, I've been at the Cary Memorial Library a few times. I think last summer was the last time I was here. So, yeah. You ever run into situations where the child is sincerely asking for something that nobody can deliver? Oh, yes. It might be for a bring back my uncle who died. Or, I mean, there's just got to be a thousand. Yeah. And what? how do you deal when somebody makes an impossible request? Yeah. The first time it ever happened to me, I was out in Hopkinton at a drugstore, and this little girl, maybe four or five year old, sat on my lap, and I noticed what I thought was to be her mom kind of off to the side, and I said, oh, you know, she wasn't answering any questions, and usually you can kind of get, you know, what's your favorite color, or, you know, um, you know, how old are you now? She wasn't answering anything. I said, is there anything Santa can bring you? And she said, can you bring mommy and daddy back? So it turns out, the aunt explained to me afterwards, uh, her parents had been killed in a car crash a few months previous, and now she was visiting with me. Um, I, I had gone to a Santa school, so fortunately I was prepared for this. I said, you know what, there's only so much even Santa Claus can do, but I want you to know that I'm going to keep you in my heart, I'm going to pray for you, and I, you know, I want you to know that Santa loves you very much. So there's, there's some things you can't do. You know, I've, I've gotten deceased pets, deceased parents, grandparents, that kind of thing. It, it does happen. Um, you know, and I just try to, over the years I've learned to reemphasize that um, 
Santa loves you, Santa's there to support you, you know, everybody, you know, Santa's, Santa's there to, to bring the joy of the season, and that's what I try to focus in on. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Um, who in your lifetime has been most inspirational to you to be Santa Claus? Uh, my father. Um, my father played Santa Claus uh, a number of times, and he was terrible. Um, <laughs> and when I say that, like, he really, he would pull down the beard to talk to people. Um, <laughs> the best story was he, in his later years, played Santa Claus at his condo complex, and they left him alone to put on the Santa suit. But somehow he put on a woman's red jacket that had her car keys in it. So he's going around in this very obvious jacket that's on Santa. And this woman comes up to him and says, you're wearing my jacket. And he says, oh no, this is Santa's jacket. And she says, you're wearing my coat. You have my car keys. For an hour she chased him around. <laughs> him thinking she was just, you know, some nut job. But um, after my dad passed, I looked back and I realized that he embodied everything about Santa. He was a leader. Um, you know, he brought joy to every child. He was inspired, um, you know, to make people feel good about themselves. So even though my dad was not the greatest Santa in, in a lot of ways, he was the greatest Santa to me. Yes. Uh, have you ever uh, needed to personally deliver a gift? Yes. Uh, actually, so coming back to that story I told you about Ryan, um, I got in touch with his mom and money was a little bit tight. He lived in Woburn. So Santa delivered that green skateboard that year. And I got to have a nice little visit with him and it was it was a positive experience for me. Usually, you know, I'm not going to do anything like that, but that was, you know, very special circumstances. And I felt a connection with him. Like, I felt like it was my job to be there for him. And I was very lucky for that opportunity. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, fantastic. This will go right up the North Pole. Oh, look at this. So this is an appreciation of your presentation. Our Rotary Club will donate enough money to vaccinate 40 children from polio. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. That's really great. All right. That's amazing. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, pardon me. We've got to stop meeting like this. All right. So, and our last point of business is the 50 50 raffle. Coming.